Hello, I'm Victor Strandberg, and we're about to undertake the final session in this course on T.S. Eliot. In our last session, we took up T.S. Eliot's, basically his cultural criticism. Uh, T.S. Eliot, who defined himself as an Anglo-Catholic in religion and a classicist in literature, and we ended up with the Christian classicist writer who wanted to lead us to a condition of serenity, stillness, and reconciliation. The ultimate purpose, Eliot claimed, of any major artist. Uh, in this session, we're going to take up his literary theory. Uh, he did lead a revolution in poetry, and we might say in literature generally. And he also wrote a substantial amount of literary criticism to, in effect, justify and explain this revolution in our modern literary sensibility. So uh, in the document that I have made available with this lecture, uh, on page three, under Roman numeral three, we get Eliot, the critical theorist. And the first item under the critical theorist would be the idea, or Eliot's idea, of the purpose of criticism. He says, for his first point, criticism appears to be, excuse me, um, criticism must always profess an end in view, which appears to be the elucidation of works of art and the correction of taste. Now that second purpose, I think must be handled gingerly. It is true that criticism can lead to a more sophisticated taste in any art form. But as far as correcting someone else's taste, insisting that they must accept my taste, I think we'd best shy away from that. Eliot did sometimes have a quasi-authoritarian streak, uh, and given his enormous influence, his place as the highest of all gurus of uh, literary achievement in the first half of the 20th century, we can understand the temptation to be authoritarian and to correct other people's taste. But I think uh, beyond a certain level of sophistication, I think we'd say that it's best to leave everyone to their own taste. Chacun a son goût, each to his own taste, as the French would say. However, the first of these two purposes, the correction of taste and the elucidation of art, uh, that purpose is very much at the center of what we've been doing, to elucidate the poetry of T.S. Eliot, to facilitate a better understanding. And I do think that that is legitimately the purpose of literary criticism, certainly as it's been practiced in these lectures. The means by which the elucidation of works of art must be accomplished are cited as comparison and analysis of the chief tools of the critic. Yes, especially, I think, analysis to study the internal dynamics of a work of art, in this case, Eliot's poetry to follow the themes, the images, the uh, unfolding of the pattern or design of the poem, uh, perhaps to do something with the sound effects, that and many other things, uh, chasing down allusions, for example, would go under the heading of analysis of a work of poetry. Another purpose of criticism that Eliot cites is as a protection against the artist. And uh, I think what he says here is psychologically astute. Everyone, I believe, who is at all sensible to the seductions of poetry can remember some moment in youth when he or she was completely carried away by the work of one poet. What happens is a kind of inundation the invasion of the undeveloped personality 
by the stronger personality of the poet. It is our growing critical power which protects us from excessive possession by any one literary personality. The best example I know of in my own experience is that of young people who've been reading Anne Rand and are completely swept away. Uh, these will include some of the most intelligent people I've uh, ever known in my classes. I think particularly long ago of a student named Prudence Brooks at the University of Vermont, brilliant A-plus student, who was completely um, dominated in her uh, thinking by the writings of Anne Rand. And uh, I think uh, some protection against so powerful a personality as that of Miss Rand uh, is what criticism can offer, according to Eliot. And I think he's quite right about it. Uh, we move on to poetic theory. And one of the, I think, more mystifying statements that Eliot produced is what comes up next. The only way of expressing emotion in the form of art is by finding an objective correlative. In other words, a set of objects, a situation, a chain of events, which will be the formula of that particular emotion, such that when uh, the, the external facts are given, the emotion is immediately evoked. Now, that's a pretty complicated sentence, and I don't know if anyone is exactly certain of what the objective correlative is. But I think our best uh, answer is that in drama, as Eliot goes on to explain when he talks about Hamlet in drama, the objective correlative would be proper motivation for the character's behavior and feelings, uh, something which is lacking in Eliot's view in Shakespeare's character called Hamlet. I think in poetry, the best version of the objective correlative would be the image or the symbol, uh, or similar terms, a simile uh, or, or metaphor, uh, which is able to transmit a complex of emotion and intellect simultaneously. Uh, we objectify the emotion by placing it within the symbol or the image or the metaphor. It's contained there uh, and objectified there and it does carry both the intellectual and emotional power that the artist seeks to transmit. Now, this talk about the objective correlative is part of the longer essay, Hamlet and His Problems, published in 1919. And it's worth taking a look at Shakespeare's understanding of Hamlet, both the play and the character of that name. Rather notoriously, T.S. Eliot said the following, so far from being Shakespeare's masterpiece, Hamlet, the play, is most certainly an artistic failure. The reason why it is a failure is because, going on, Hamlet, like the sonnets, is full of some stuff that the writer could not drag to light, contemplate, or manipulate into art. Which is to say that Hamlet is full of some very powerful feelings that are not justified by anything that happens in the play. Hamlet the man, Eliot goes on to say, is dominated by an emotion which is inexpressible because it is in excess of the facts as they appear in the play. Hamlet is up against a difficulty that his disgust is occasioned by his mother but this mother is not an adequate equivalent for it or motive for it. His disgust envelops and exceeds her. It is thus a feeling that he cannot understand, he cannot objectify it. Uh, in the character Hamlet, this emotion is the buffoonery of an emotion that can find no outlet in action. In the dramatist Shakespeare, it is the buffoonery 
of an emotion he cannot express in art. Now, I took Eliot's clue that Hamlet, like the sonnets, is full of some stuff that the writer could not drag to light, contemplate, or manipulate into art. I followed that and actually did an extended study of Shakespeare's sonnets concerning this stuff. And I think both in Shakespeare and in the sonnets, or in Shakespeare's life uh, alongside the sonnets, we get the two dominant emotions that appear excessive in the play and in the character Hamlet. Uh, they're two of the most powerful experiences in human life, sex and death. In Hamlet, the play, we have Hamlet wanting to commit suicide at the beginning, presumably because his father has died, but quite rightly, his mother and, and stepfather remind him that every man has to suffer the death of his father, commonly, and uh, that we have to uh, learn to accept these griefs and, and go on. Uh, it turns out that it isn't only the death of his father that bothers Hamlet. It's also sex. He is revolted, full of revulsion against his mother's sexuality, it spills over against this perfectly innocent sweetheart of his, Ophelia, whom he describes, indeed calls to her face, a whore. Get thee to a nunnery was in slang. Get thee to a whorehouse, that's where you belong. And the question is why this inexpressibly black mood in Hamlet concerning sex and death? Well, we find out that concerning death, Shakespeare's only son, Hamnet Shakespeare died in 1596, an 11-year-old boy, uh, at the time when we think Shakespeare was beginning to write Hamlet. So far as the other part of experience, sex, is concerned, in these sonnets, we have the great love affair of Shakespeare with two people, the golden boy and the dark lady. Uh, the two Lovers found each other, and poor Shakespeare was more or less shoved out of the way in the lives of both of these lovers as they found each other. And the enormous bitterness and cynicism that Shakespeare himself experienced concerning sex, I think, spills over into Hamlet's corrosive revulsion against sexuality altogether. I say we'll have no more marriages, uh, as Hamlet says. And um, those two feelings, I think, uh, also affected other plays, King Lear and others, as uh, Shakespeare's career went on. Now, if anyone were interested, I've written a lengthy explication of the sonnets of Shakespeare in the light of this thesis. Uh, and um, anyone who's interested can find it on a site website called Duke Space, D-U-K-E-S-P-A-C-E, -E, where you tap on faculty publications, look up my name, Victor Strandberg, and there you'll find The Secret Life of William Shakespeare, a study of this a psychological phenomenon that T.S. Eliot touched on and which I followed up. Um, item two under literary criticism of T.S. Eliot, gives Eliot's own rationale for the difficulty of his poetry, what seemed to be the incomprehensibility of it initially. And he says it's because modern life is so complex. It appears likely that the poets in our civilization must be difficult. Our civilization com comprehends great variety and complexity, and this variety and complexity must produce various and complex results. The poet must become more and more comprehensive, more elusive, um, more indirect, in order to force, to dislocate, if necessary, language into his meaning. He goes on and says that something like, the result is something like the metaphysical poetry of John Donne or Shakespeare and others. Um, and indeed this commentary appears in an essay called The Metaphysical Poets, 1921. 
In that same essay, I go on to the next snippet of Eliot's comment uh, of his own uh, essays. Those who look into the artificiality of Milton or Dryden sometimes tell us to look into our hearts and write. But that's not looking deep enough. Racine or Dunn looked into a good deal more than the heart. One must look into the cerebral cortex, the nervous system, and the digestive tracts to get the material of modern poetry. Next item concerns the new realism of language that this revolution in poetry called for. Every revolution in poetry is apt to be and sometimes to announce itself as a return to common speech. That's a revolution that Wordsworth announced in his prefaces around 1800. And he was right. But the same revolution had been carried out a century earlier by Oldham, Waller, Denham, and Dryden. The spoken language goes on changing and the poetic idiom passes out of date. We have next the musical principle of organization. And he uses a play of Shakespeare as an example. The play of Shakespeare is a very complex musical structure. The use of recurrent themes is as natural to poetry as to music. There are possibilities for verse which bear analogy to the development of a theme by different groups of instruments. There are possibilities of transitions in a poem, comparable to the different movements of a symphony or a quartet. There are possibilities of contrapuntal development of subject matter. It is in the concert room that the germ of a poem may be quickened. But the next citation has to do with free verse. Eliot is a little bit agitated. Uh, by, I think, being accused of writing free verse. And so he says here, using the French term, verse libre, free verse, does not exist. The ghost of some simple meter should lack behind the arras in even the freest verse. Rhyme removed, the poet is at once held up to the standards of prose. Rhyme removed, much ethereal music leaps up from the word music which has hitherto chirped unnoticed in the expanse of prose. And rhyme forbidden, many shag pats were unwaked bad poets. This liberation from rhyme might as well be a liberation of rhyme. Freed from its task of supporting lame verse, it could be applied with greater effect where it is most needed. It is this contrast between fixity and flux, this unperceived evasion of monotony, which is the very life of verse. He talks finally in this segment of our discussion about prosody. And here he takes up his lifelong battle against iambic, uh, the iambic meter because it is the most common natural meter in the English language. You ask if mine were a personal prosody. It may be too personal a prosody. I felt it was necessary to find a metric as far removed as possible from the iambic pentameter. It may be that the norm of English versification is iambic pentameter, but the only way to refresh it from one time to another will be to get away from it in a curve which will gradually return, having freed itself from the stiffness of previous generations. Well, it is notable how often Eliot avoids the iambic beat as he begins various poems. Uh, think back to Prufrock. Uh, let us go then, now, you and I. Or we think of, uh, let's say, the wasteland. April is the cruelest month. Or we think of the hollow man. We are the hollow man. Uh, again and again, he begins his lines with a strong beat to avoid the iambic pattern, which he thinks is too common in English, though he'll welcome it back again after it's been 
uh, refreshed. I'm concluding now uh, this segment on Eliot's literary criticism with a section that I call kudos or praises for other poets who influenced him. The first statement that he makes, this is in 1961, a few years before his death, uh, concerns Jules Lafourg. I have written about Baudelaire, but nothing about Jules Lafourg, to whom I owe more than to any poet in any language. That's enormously high praise, considering what he said about other poets in other languages. He goes on to praise Baudelaire um, as the first counter-romantic in poetry. Baudelaire gave new possibilities to poetry and a new stock of imagery of contemporary life. It is not merely in the use of imagery of common life, not merely in the use of imagery of the sordid life of a great metropolis, but in the elevation of such imagery to the first intensity that Baudelaire has created a mode of expression for other men, including obviously Eliot. Next set of praises, Dante and Shakespeare divide the modern world between them. There is no third. He goes on and explains why Dante and Shakespeare divide the world. He says the rage of Dante against Florence, the deep surge of Shakespeare's general cynicism and disillusionment are merely gigantic attempts to metamorphose private failures and disappointments. The great poet in writing himself writes his time. Mm, it's quite possible that's why Eliot became so celebrated an artist in writing about his own struggle, especially his struggle through uh, the naturalistic morbidity of his earlier years, he was expressing uh, a great problem of our time, a spiritual crisis. Next, uh, he makes a statement about Shakespeare that surely applies to himself. The standard set by Shakespeare is that of a continuous development from first to last. A development in which the choice both of theme and of dramatic and verse technique in each play seems to be determined by the particular stage of his emotional maturity at the time. We must know all of Shakespeare's work in order to know any of it. And that is surely true of T.S. Eliot. To know Eliot well, you must know all his work to trace his development from Prufrock on through uh, The Wasteland, The Hollow Men, Ash Wednesday, and if possible, through four quartets. Next, um, he speaks of a reason why he envied Dante. Dante had, in effect, a unified European culture behind his writing. Uh, the whole world was Christian at that time, the Western world, and it did have a single language for educated people, Latin, though of course Dante chose to use the vernacular Italian. This is what Eliot says about that issue. The culture of Dante was one, excuse me, was not of one European country, but of Europe. There is no poet in any tongue who stands so firmly as a model for all poets. One has learned from the Inferno that the greatest poetry can be written with the greatest economy of words and with the greatest austerity in the use of metaphor, simile, verbal beauty, and elegance. That's what he learned from the Inferno. From the Purgatorio, one learns that a straightforward philosophical statement can be great poetry. And that, I think, is a basis of four quartets, which is filled with straightforward philosophical statements uh, as Eliot ascribed to Dante in the Purgatorio. I conclude with two comments about Milton, and we won't go into detail on those. 
the first in 1936, condemns Milton uh, because Milton writes English like a dead language. Well, it certainly was not common speech, Paradise Lost and uh, Samson Agonistes and so forth. And then he goes on and attacks Milton personally. And what I find fascinating is that in each category of denunciation, Eliot himself could well be vulnerable either from the moralist point of view, or from the theologian's point of view, or from the psychologist's point of view, or from that of the political philosopher, or judging by ordinary standards of likableness in human beings, Milton is unsatisfactory. Uh, Eleven years later, in 1947, Eliot published another essay on Milton, Making Amends, admitting that the problem with Milton is that he was so great an artist that he made writing an epic poem impossible after his own time, in the same way that Shakespeare made writing a great poetic drama impossible after his time. And so he admits that indeed, Milton is a great artist, great genius. Indeed, he says that um, to be able to control so many words at once is a token of a mind of most exceptional energy. He apologizes to Milton then by admitting, it inevitably happens that young poets engage in a revolution, will exalt the merits of those poets of the past to offer them example and stimulation, and depreciate the merits of poets who do not stand for the qualities they are zealous to realize. Uh, okay, I think that will do it, folks. Uh, we are through with our study of T.S. Eliot. Uh, this has been a bare bones sort of analysis of T.S. Eliot's literary and cultural criticism. Uh, and it, like our study of its poetry, uh, another bare bones effort I think, nonetheless, will offer a platform from which to launch out to additional study uh, under other auspices. Uh, that's it for this course.